Hello, this is Simon Brew. I'm the editor of Film Stories magazine and a very warm welcome to the Film Stories podcast. Come with me. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. In movies, movies that had stories. And the story just sucks them in. This is just the beginning. Stories. We would be honoured if you would join us. Hello and a very warm welcome to Film Stories with Simon Brew. I am Simon Brew. As always, it's absolutely everything you need to know about me. The aim of the podcast, though, well, I'm here to talk off the stories of films, as the title suggests. And I tend to talk about development stories, production stories, marketing stories, release stories, all the ingredients that go towards making the films that we know and sometimes love. Just that, the films that we know and sometimes love. The films I tend to cover on this podcast, they lean more towards the mainstream than anything else. They're films I'm interested in or invested in to some degree. I try not to do snark. I try not to punch down. This podcast is a celebration of movies and a real appreciation that somehow films get made. My print magazines associated with this podcast exactly the same. It's appreciation of films at their heart. You can find more on those at store.filmstories.co.uk. But for now, I've preambled enough. I'll come to the story. The other side of this. I am Detective Lieutenant Elliot, and this is Trooper Wagner. We just want to ask a few questions. We understand the night of his demise, the family have gathered to celebrate your father's 85th birthday. How was it, by the way? The party? Pre my dad's death? Oh, it was great. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to request that you all stay until the investigation is completed. What? Can we ask why? Has something changed? No. No, it hasn't changed or no, we can't ask. No, you can't ask. That is a clip from 2019's Knives Out, written and directed by Ryan Johnson, with a cast, a huge cast, including Daniel Craig, Chris Evans, Anna de Armas, Jamie Lee Curtis, Michael Shannon, there's Don Johnson, you get Tony Collette, Lakeith Stanfield in there too, Christopher Plummer. I, I mean, the list could go on for an awful long time. And the story of it, well, it goes back to the aftermath of Ryan Johnson's debut movie as a feature director, 2005's Brick, a film that many continue to hold, rightly so, in high regard as well. And it was then that he began noodling with the idea of a modern mystery movie. I I mean, Ryan Johnson was a fan of the film adaptations, in particular of the work of Agatha Christie. He used to love watching those films. And he was conceiving the idea then of a modern day spin, a modern day murder mystery. This was before Kenneth Branagh decided to adapt the books of Agatha Christie himself and bring Poirot back to the big screen. And as Johnson told The Hollywood Reporter, he said murder mysteries growing up had been comfort food for him. Now, in 2008, he moved on to a project that didn't spark instantly, really. 2008's film was The Brothers Bloom, and this wasn't a raging success at the time, although it continues to be held in high regard since. But if there was a film that really put him heavily on the map, it was 2012's critical and commercial success, Looper, starring Joseph Gordon-Levitt and Bruce Willis, a film I've covered before on this podcast. And it was in the aftermath of Looper's success that Ryan Johnson suddenly had a slate of options in front of him. Now, the original plan there was, well, I'm going to press ahead with this murder mystery film, the film that would become Knives Out. However, Looper had brought him to the attention of Lucasfilm. Lucasfilm now under the ownership of Disney. And in particular, Disney was looking for directors for a fresh slate of Star Wars movies. And an offer went out to Ryan Johnson to direct what would become 2017 Star Wars Episode 8, The Last Jedi. He took the opportunity. Now, he'd planned to do Knives Out, but then Star Wars had come calling and Star Wars took precedent. Now, the next few years were dominated by Star Wars for Ryan Johnson, but it was immediately following the release of that film. And I'm sure I'll come to the film uh, to The Last Jedi at some point on this podcast. In very early 2018, he realised he had a small gap of time that professionally he'd been recruited off the back of The Last Jedi to to come up with and oversee a new trilogy of Star Wars movies. So that was very much on his slate to do. He wasn't going to be directing the ninth 
Star Wars, uh, episode nine in the Star Wars franchise that would go on to become the rise of Skywalker. Instead, his view for as far as Star Wars is concerned was far further in the future. And so that left this space. And so he went back to his murder mysteries idea, his murder mystery film. And he started just penning it. He started, he would say in interviews that even though the film had been in his head for a long time, it would be wrong to say he'd been constantly working on it. And it was only at the start of 2018, really, he could put some, a dedicated clump of time into the project. And he was working with his longtime producing partner, Ram Bergman. And what Bergman came up with was a schedule that would allow Johnson and Bergman to make Knives Out be really, really quickly before he was due back on Star Wars duties. Because the question they started noodling at the start of 2018 was, could they turn this film round start to finish in under a year? And so they kind of plotted that back. Well, you'd want to start shooting it as late in the year as you could because the thing isn't written at this point. And so October 2018 would have to be the start of production. They'd need around eight weeks to get the film done in time for Christmas as well. So not a short shoot, but also a relatively economic one. And there was the small matter of the fact that Ryan Johnson had to write the thing as well. And even though there were ideas at that point, there wasn't really a script that they could put in front of people and say, do you want to do this film? So no cast, no script, no company backing it, no budget, no real, no, no, nothing really of substance short of the fact that they could, that they realised that it, they had a shot here, that they could do this, that they could at least try and do it by the end of 2018. And as Ryan Johnson would admit, it was, it was the tightness of that schedule that would give him the nudge he ultimately needed, that he would reflect to The Hollywood Reporter in a separate piece he said i'm a very slow writer so the timeline that they'd set out quote seemed ridiculous to me but i sat down and did it and did it he did that he he dug back into the agatha christie star he moved it to the modern day he weaved in modern politics comments on modern society he named his characters after 70s musicians he invented this central character of a detective by the name of benoit blanc and the ingredients were slowly coming together for the story that he wanted to tell now johnson was working in parallel with ram bergman at this point that johnson was writing he was pulling back on the swearing i should note just so he could get a p G13 rating in the US that one of the original drafts of Knives Out was a bit more potty mouthed and then Bergman was starting the preparation work for the film he was bringing back personnel who'd gone through the experience of making The Last Jedi with Ryan Johnson checking out availability does anyone else fancy joining us on this on this balmy adventure and also he started scouting out well just where can we shoot the film because he knew that the story that johnson was fashioning was going to be set primarily around one big mansion and so for the purposes of that they would need a mansion they weren't going to build one they were going to do this on location where they could and bergman soon identified a place in massachusetts where they could set the bulk of the film in came David Crank as production uh, as production designer, even as Ryan Johnson kept writing. And so David Crank was then looking at the house, trying to put in all the tiny little details. He started redressing the house. If you look particularly at the doll's house in the movie, that is something that David Crank talked about in interviews as well, just to demonstrate the level of detail they went to in the dressing of the set. And then it was a case of Johnson just tying up the script as he would talk to Vulture about. He would show the script to some of his friends and he would be greeted with some degree of scepticism by friends as well. Johnson would say a few reactions were, well, we like this kind of movie, but why do you want to do this? And Johnson admitted he did stop and think about that. But then he said, I felt like I knew deep down inside why I wanted to do it. Now, it was a tricky one as well to send out into the world because where are we? 2018. This is this is key franchise season for for the big movie studios. They're not but they weren't seen to be looking for standalone movies, original standalone movies. It was pre-existing books, material, sequels, franchises, universes. And so trying to get something else through that and then the even bigger challenge, making it a hit at the box office, that suddenly that had become the end of level boss challenge in the in the business of making movies. But still, Johnson was on schedule. The script was finally done in August of 2018. And that gave them, what, two months before filming was due to begin. A couple of problems there. First of all, they didn't have the money they needed at the start of August 2018 to make the film. 
Second of all, they didn't have a cast. To repeat, it was two months before filming was due to begin, but fate would play them a very, very useful hand. Because running parallel with this, there was the development of the new James Bond film, the project that would ultimately morph into No Time to Die. But in 2018, it was Danny Boyle who'd signed on to direct whatever the new James Bond film was going to be. Daniel Craig had confirmed he was going to return for one final adventure as 007. Yet, creative differences were bubbling in the world of Bond and Danny Ball would ultimately walk away from the project and one of the repercussions of that was a delay in the shoot of the new James Bond film. That it, it, The intention was it was going to go before the cameras, if not late 2018, certainly early 2019, and that locked down Daniel Craig's schedule. However, all of a sudden, a window opened up Craig had some availability and also Johnson was very aware that Craig had been just just willing to go off piste a little bit you look at his wonderful comedic performance in Steven Soderbergh's Logan Lucky for instance and so a meeting was arranged the opportunity was there Johnson and Daniel Craig came together and it was a very very quick meeting of minds that Craig had been on the shortlist for the detective Benoit Blanc but within days of the Bond film being delayed, Johnson and Craig were meeting about what became Knives Out. And Craig was very, very quickly on board. This wasn't a case of a movie star taking a long time to make a decision. Craig liked this. Craig wanted in. And they were soon down to granular discussions, really, about what to do with the character, where to take the character, how should the character speak as well. The infamous accent would ultimately be influenced by a writer by the name of Shelby Foote. And so this this was the level of chat that they were having. It was very, very clear, very, very early in the chat. Daniel Craig was in. Now, this was gold dust for Knives Out because not only had Ryan Johnson come off the back of a Star Wars film that had grossed $1.3 billion at the global box office, and obviously it's within the umbrella of the Star Wars universe, so it was always going to do big money, but it always helps to have a big hit behind you. Just look at how James Mangold managed to get Le Mans 66 off the ground because his Wolverine X-Men film, Logan, had done good money. That No one's saying that that was all down to James Mangold, that it made money, that there was the pre-existing franchise, the pre-existing character, but he'd done a good job. There'd been a return of cash come in, and as such, that greases the wheels for the next project you want to do. So straight away, Ryan Johnson had some currency there for whatever his next film was going to be. But the hiring of Daniel Craig, the incumbent James Bond, well, not only did that open the eyes of financiers, but it's also a magnitude it when you get a talent like that on a film for other performers who want to join him. And so heading towards the Toronto Film Festival in 2018 and particularly the film market in an attempt to attract funding for the film, they had something that was coming together. You had Ryan Johnson coming off the back of this massively successful film. You had Daniel Craig agreeing to star and you had a budget that was going to be in the region of what about 40 million dollars, something like that. Also, Kenneth Branagh's Murder on the Orient Express, that had proven to be a box office hit in 2017 and had also been a very big seller on DVD and Blu-ray as well. And so the, the whole package just had the requisite degree of weight to get people interested in it. And there was a couple of stories over the funding of the movie, how it ultimately came together. But the story that appears to be the, the, the actual true one is even before it got to the Toronto Film Festival, the funding for Knives Out was in place that a company by the name of MRC offered backing for the project and the budget was being raised. The funding was sorted and Knives Out was a go project, if you like, even before they'd stepped on a plane to go to the Toronto Film Festival. Now, this was still just weeks before the film was due to start shooting. And in fact, it still needed a distributor. That deal was only done two weeks before the film was due to start shooting, with Lionsgate coming on board and agreeing to distribute the movie. And so the $40 million budget, it was agreed, would be split 50-50 between MRC and Lionsgate. Ryan Johnson had the money he needed. He had the start of his cast, but he was still in a little bit of a race against time. He and producer Ram Bourbon to, to just pull the rest of this together. And so it was a case, as Johnson told The Hollywood Reporter, not of sending a script out to a load of people and asking them to think about it and come back to them. He said in this case, it was uh, saying, can you show up in four weeks in Massachusetts and just have fun with us doing this murder mystery? And Johnson admitted 
that really made it more appealing for the actors that he was going to. So, for instance, Chris Evans was living in the Massachusetts area at that point and he completed his Marvel Cinematic Universe filming duties. And so at this stage in his career, he was just looking at a bit of downtime. Go back to Massachusetts, put your feet up, put on a nice jumper, get the fire on, just 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 relax and just drop out of the film world just for a little while. But there all of a sudden was a script on his front door, one that involved Daniel Craig, an ensemble, so he wasn't going to have to carry it or anything like that. And so Chris Evans just, just felt he just couldn't turn this down. Here was a really good project just on his doorstep. Now, it's worth noting as well, one of the things that Ryan Johnson did, oftentimes with a film that's got so many spoilers, certain actors only get part of the script or you have to go into a room and sign something and be locked away for an hour and then the script gets put back in a safe or something like that none of that here every actor it went out to got the full script because they wanted that Johnson wanted them to know the context of it the tone of it just really what the project was and he had no problem with them seeing the full thing and making their decision to take part really based on the entirety of the screenplay now, I've done multiple junkets for multiple films over the years. And one of the cliches that comes out of a junket is when you hear someone say, oh, I only dreamed of one person in that role or I wrote that. I wrote that part specifically for one person. That was absolutely not said and also absolutely not the case where Knives Out was was concerned. I mean, chatting to RogerEbert.com, Johnson was in conversation with one of the cast, Michael Shannon, and he confirmed, he just said, I don't write with anyone in mind. In His process is you get the script done and it's like you sit down and you think, who would be good for what? And in this particular case, for one particular role, he sent the script out to Michael Shannon and they got on and they clicked and that worked. And that was a fairly common story across the ensemble that was drawn together. Now, there were names just joining joining up. I mean, Jamie Lee Curtis signed up, Christopher Plummer. I mean, he talked about his response on seeing the script was, I just loved it immediately. And he talked about that with Parade, not that one. And this was, again, being reflected by other people joining in. But one of the toughest, if not the toughest role to cast, this came up in interviews ahead of the release of the film, was that of the character of Marta. And if you've not seen the film, I'm not doing spoilers on any of the characters or the ending. I should note that. But the person who managed to identify the right performer was the casting director of Knives Out, someone by the name of Mary Vernio. And what she did was she went off to see Blade Runner 2049. Very wise, very good film that as well. And that's where she spotted in a supporting role Anna de Armas. Now, Anna de Armas hadn't gone on to do James Bond or, or anything like that at this point. She was an up and coming new acting talent. And she was spotted and called in for a meeting with Ryan Johnson and was soon cast in the movie. This, this extensive ensemble cast was pretty much in place. Uh, one thing Anna de Armas needed to be on top of was, was being able to make a good vomiting sound. That was one of the demands of her character. And so she got down to work getting that done while the rest of the pre-production was completed. And it got to a point that this, this time scale, this really contracted time scale was really paying off for the film because on October the 30th, 2018, off they went to Massachusetts for the filming of Knives Out. The first shot was called on that day. Now, the mansion that would be home for the for the bulk of the movie as we see it's actually a couple of different locations in the end were required to recreate it and then the upper floors of the mansion that we also see well on location they couldn't actually make those work on film the contracted space just didn't really suit what Johnson was writing down in his screenplay and so at that there was a part of the production where they did go off and do some more traditional soundstage work with some set construction involved a key influence, it's worth noting, on the look of it was 1972's Sleuth, not the remake. Um, that was informing just, just a little bit of the visual style of it, although you'll see lots of touch points right throughout Knives Out. I don't think you have to look too far to see some of them. Um, one little bit of trivia that Johnson discovered during the filming, uh, and, and certainly during the preparation of the film, he revealed this in a piece to Vanity Fair, was he wanted to get hold of some iPhones from Apple for the characters to use in the movie and what he discovered is apple has this rule that yeah you'll supply iphones to use in a film no problem whatsoever but villains are not allowed to use them so if you're forearmed with that kind of knowledge and you go and see a murder mystery and one of the characters who might be a suspect is using an iphone it would be a fair bet 
that they are not the bad person in the film. Now, I don't know if that holds right throughout the history of cinema, but it sounds incredibly plausible to me that Apple would be that controlling over just who's allowed to use an iPhone on film. It was still a hard deadline to get the film wrapped for the end of December, which was as long as they had because they didn't really have the safety net of going weeks over schedule or an awful lot of time for pickup shots or anything like that. Primarily because Daniel Craig still has his, w his 007 commitments to attend to that the requirement was he needed to be on set and on location to reprise the role of James Bond in two at the start of 2019. So this film had to be done. So it was a bit all hands on deck, but most of the cast, I've not seen, in fact, I've not seen any dissenters really, were reporting in interviews that this was an enjoyable shoot. And Johnson was encouraging them to kind of probe at the plot a little bit. Can you find, I mean, is it watertight? Can you find any problems with the mystery? And it was, it was a case that they would keep asking questions and they wouldn't be able to break it. That it just felt like the story that Johnson had fashioned, built off the back of watching and watching and reading. Um, an awful lot of murder mysteries and that fan the fandom of Agatha Christie well it was working and the core story that he put together was holding even as the other more contemporary themes were just woven around him Christopher Plummer again would tell Parade again not that one that we laughed a lot during the making of the film he says when you've got a cast like that it makes for more competition suddenly you're really on your toes you have to be and that's healthy the shoot in the end went on. There were 38 filming days in Knives Out. It wrapped up on time. It wrapped up on budget. The last shot was called on December the 21st, 2018. And that gave Johnson what, about eight months in post-production just to fashion and complete his film before he was back off to galaxies far, far away. So as Johnson got down to the editing of the movie, he also brought in a composer very early. He'd been talking to a composer by the name of Nathan Johnson very, I mean, years and years before, even when he was just, he was just noodling with the idea of Knives Out before he'd made Looper even, the first conversation was had. And so Johnson came in and composed the score. That's Nathan Johnson, not Ryan Johnson, just in case like, I, I'm making this even more confusing than usual. Meanwhile, there was a little bit of visual effects work that needed to be done as well. And the cut was coming together. I mean, the cut was being locked down and Lionsgate was taking a look at it and Lionsgate was really enthused with what it had. That it knew it had a, a bit of a marketing challenge because it was going to fire this film out. It was, it was identifying the end of the year as a release slot for it and there was going to be a lot of competition at the end of the year. So it knew it had to come up with something that would cut through, that would at least give it a sporting chance of making a box office return. Again, the success of Murder on the Orient Express that gave it some confidence the strength of the cast list that gave it some confidence as well Lionsgate put out the first trailer in April of 2009 and then the preview screenings got underway just in the early summer and as Johnson would tell Deadline he said part of the fun for me from the very first preview screening was observing how a full house had a communal experience in watching the movie. And he described that whole process as really gratifying. And they were doing preview screenings across that summer. And Lionsgate, again, its confidence in the film began to rise further and further and further. It was, in fact, I, I remember talking to someone working at Lionsgate in that summer and they just, they just, noted to me and they were always very honest about their films they just said this is the one to watch this one is 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 special this one is going to stand out and so it programmed its premiere at the toronto ironically enough the toronto international film festival in september the 7th 2019 if you go back to 2018 remember it was a case of take potentially taking the package along to try and raise funding just a year before at that same festival and now it was going to be getting its debut the reception well it went down a treat the reviews from the Toronto Film Festival were really 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 strong standout performances right throughout the cast Tony Collette Michael Shannon Jamie Lee Curtis Chris Evans again and particularly Daniel Craig at the heart of it they were being lauded in the critical notices that were coming up and it was also the fact that 
that Johnson's Johnson's writing, really, his structure of the film and his willingness to just take chances with the way he told his story. All of these things were were, were praised. That it, there was pushback. It was perhaps over the length of it, but it was all. I mean, that was more than made up for just by how funny the film was and ultimately how good a murder mystery it was. A really good ensemble cast having an awful lot of fun in a tightly written film. And so the response at Toronto was, was strong enough that Lionsgate just continued to double down on the promotion for it. In fact, one of the things it did was it looked to generate an awful lot of word of mouth through social marketing. Now, this was not massively unusual at this point, but that was primarily where Lionsgate was putting the bulk of its focus. It, wa it was protecting the secrets of the film, but it just wanted to get conversations going. And one byproduct of that was that when the film ultimately arrived in cinemas, it got a higher than expected amount of walk up business. And this is people who didn't pre-book their tickets. They just perhaps heard about the film, walked along to their local cinema, took a look at it. And it's just like, yeah, I'm going to go and see that. They weren't necessarily choosing the film day, weeks, months before. They were there on a whim because they'd heard of it. And what Ram Bergman told Deadline just said Lionsgate didn't try to sell the movie on what it's not. They loved the script and what we made. Lionsgate believed that day one we could go wide, not just to a sophisticated adult crowd, but reach everyone. And so that decision by Ryan Johnson to cut all the swearing out, well, that was also <laughs> turned out to be quite a useful ingredient in the midst of all of it. So let's go to the film's release. In America, it came out the weekend of the 27th of November to the 1st of December in 2019, the Thanksgiving holiday, and straight in second place with a 41 million dollar opening weekend so that's appreciating it's not a case that every dollar spent at the at the box office goes back to the film company far far from it on paper at least the takings from week one had covered the production budget of course it would take a little while to go into profit but it would nonetheless go into profit the films that were around at the time as well i mean frozen 2 was topping the chart by a long 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 way on its second weekend that had grossed 120 25 million. Le Mans 66 or Ford v Ferrari, depending where you live in the world, was in third place and doing very nicely, thank you. A Beautiful Day in the Neighbourhood was fourth. The other big opener was Queen and Slim, opening with $16 million. And a, a real thought that there might be a better Oscar run for that film than it ultimately got. The Chadwick Boseman headlined at How Missed Is He, 21 Bridges, was in the top 10 on its second week as well. Playing With Fire, underrated live action family movie. My kids love that film. Roland Emmerich's Midway, Paul Feig's Last Christmas, and then Joker was hanging around the top 10 as well. But for Knives Out, the word of mouth carried into its second weekend. In fact, it did with Le Mans 66 as well, which was on its fourth weekend and holding quite a lot of its business from week to week. In the case of Knives Out, it dropped 46% in its second weekend. Now, that that's, it sounds like a lot. That's generally regarded as a really good result. And the box office was creeping up and up. It held third place on its third weekend, even as Jumanji The Next Level, Richard Jewell, Black Christmas came along. Star Wars Episode Nine and Cats landed just like a month after Knives Out had been released. By that stage, it was still in the top five as well. It was still doing money. And in the end, Knives Out's US gross was $165 million dollars a really sensational result and four times its opening weekend as well that doesn't usually happen particularly pleasing to a film that traveled around the world that knives out will gross 147 million outside of america worldwide 312 million dollars and for a 40 million dollar film that they tried to squeeze in just just in a gap in a schedule effectively that turned into an incredible result Ryan Johnson would be nominated for an Oscar for Best Screenplay at the 2020 Academy Awards. He wouldn't win, um, but also his career from that point onwards was pivoting far more towards Knives Out than it was towards Star Wars. Here was a franchise, and it was going to be a franchise. He was open about this very early on, that he wanted more adventures for Benoit Blanc. That 
he'd come up with and was was very 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 well received and opened itself up to a lot more adventures and ryan johnson had the cachet had the clout to get those going in fact he was really active on social media at the time just engaging with fans about nights out even as he'd taken a battering for on social media just a year or a year or two before over star wars again i will come back to that and so there was talk of do you want to do another film and johnson absolutely did the deal that he did for the next film actually turned out to be a deal for two because in early 2020 it was Lionsgate that was talking about oh we're going to do a franchise with this and we're going to make sequels and we're definitely going for it but by April of 2021 in came the spending power of Netflix which paid an incredible 469 million dollars for two knives out films that's what 11 times the cost of the first movie and johnson would thus channel his energies into what would become glass onion and knives out mystery which came out in december 2022 i might come back to that in a future episode of the podcast at the point we're listening we're still waiting for well at the point we're recording we're still waiting for knives out three at the point we're recording too we're still waiting for ryan johnson's star wars trilogy which also doesn't look i mean that one doesn't look likely to happen further knives out adventures they are an absolute given so i'm going to do a couple of parish notices i'm going to alert you to the fact that our blu-rays are about to ship our brand new blu-rays we have done the uk blu-ray de debut of 1987's no way out and 1988's bull durham a pair of kevin costner headline movies that are oddly linked as well uh, as i covered in a previous episode on this podcast you can order those at store.filmstories.co.uk now we've put our own extras on there as well that's also where you can find all of our print magazines too we publish the UK's biggest film magazine, 168 pages, the latest issue, and a new issue of Film Junior. Imagine a film magazine, a print film magazine for under 15s. We do one of those and it's on sale. You can find that at store.filmstories.co.uk. If you like this podcast, there are a few different ways you can support it. I appreciate all, as many or as few as these. Just the fact you're listening is hugely appreciated. If you like it enough that you want to put some money in the pot, if you go to patreon.com slash Simon Brew, you get the podcast early. You find out the gossip of what we're up to. You get episodes absolutely ad free as well. Also, costing you nothing is just to subscribe to this podcast at your podcast home of choice. That helps with algorithms and fancy technical things I don't really understand. Likewise, if you could leave ideally a hugely positive review, that is massively, massively appreciated. Again, helps an independent with no marketing budget against a lot of the big name podcasts that otherwise would be kicking me in the shins and having me out in a fight in the playground. And that brings me to the end of this latest episode of Film Stories. As always, thank you for listening. Thank you so much for your time. If I've not bored you completely and there's a sporting chance that I have, you can find more from me on Twitter at Simon Brew. You can find more from the entire Film Stories project at Film Stories. I'm on Blue Sky as well, if anyone's on there, at Simon Brew. Film Stories can also be found on YouTube, youtube.com slash Film Stories. At Facebook, facebook.com slash Film Stories Online. The online shop is store.filmstories.co. UK. That's where our Blu-rays and our magazines hide. We've been doing loads of work on our website as well. Filmstories.co.uk is updated every weekday with loads of news. It's got reviews, it's got features, it's got mischief, it's got trouble. All the kind of things that kind of get me told off. You'll find them all there. Uh, finally, the patreon.com slash Simon Brew. I might have said that already. The, all that notwithstanding, the most important part of all of this is, well, that you're OK. I thank you so much for listening. I thank you for your time. But please look after yourselves. You all stay safe. And you know what? I'll be back soon with another bunch of film stories. Till then, take care. Bye bye.